Okay, thank, thanks everyone. Um, yesterday I gave a presentation on uh, using Scala in biomechanics with horses. Uh, unfortunately, no horses in the presentation today. <laughs> it might, might be substantially more boring. <laughs> so, uh, the idea is this is meant to be a very beginner level talk. Um, if you know a little bit about Scala, you've used it a bit, and you want to get into using libraries like Shapeless and Cats, where do you start? Um, so the problem I'm presenting is, um, you know, it's a useful toy problem. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that anything I'm presenting today is a good thing to do. It's more, you know, can you, do, can you achieve the things that I'm talking about with these libraries? So I'm going to take two small bite-sized chunks of the two libraries, um, H lists of parsers from shapeless, and then um, semi-groups and, and monoids from cats. And it's raffle based for, you know, extra adventure and watching me screw up. <laughs> okay, so what's the problem that I'm presenting? Um, if you work with data scientists a lot, you realize that data scientists love everything to be strings. And um, what they typically do when they're working with, you know, files is they'll load everything into a data frame. And then they have ways um, of deferring, you know, their type conversion until the point when they need it. So if they have a column that contains what they think is a number, they'll probably you know, actually do a numeric operation on that column. It'll get converted to a number. And then you know, if it fails at that point, well, it just fails. Um, so imagine that you've got uh, loads of files like this. You're working with data scientists. They're throwing loads of these things at you all the time. And we want to get an automated way to figure out useful information about these files. So in particular, what types are in the columns and then um, maybe if you have a, a column of dates, you might want to know what's the first date and the last date. If you have a column of doubles, you might want to produce the moments of the distribution that the doubles in that column um, have. Um, and if you've got a categorical column, so, so things like true, false, or um, other sorts of categories, you might want to know how many categories are there and make sure that your data actually conforms to that. So very broadly speaking, that's, that's the sort of problem that I'm talking about. Um, so, for the purposes of, of what I'm doing today, we'll use some really simple heuristics. Um, so, the first one is that if a string can be passed as a particular type, then it might be that particular type. Um, we can't say for sure, but you know, we can take a guess at it. Um, certainly, if we can't pass it as a given type, then it's no use to us as a, an inhabitant of that type. And then the second um, heuristic we're using is that if we've got a column and there's only limited values in that column, so you know there's there's um, 500 rows in a file and you only find three values, three distinct values in that column, then they might be a categorical variable. Um, so to restrict this problem even further, <laughs> make it nice and tractable for a demo, um, I'm only going to consider one column of a CSV file like this. So just a, a single list of strings, basically. OK, so the idea is this, this whole um, talk is executable in the REPL. So uh, these are just some imports I'm going to need later. It's the, the kind of um, classical thing you see with a lot of these. <laughs> OK, so first thing I need is a parser. So something that I can give a string, and it can say, well, either I parse it as a particular type, or I can't. So this is, I'm some, defining it as a case class. It has a pass method, and if the pass succeeds, it's going to return a, a sum of that type. If it fails, it's a non. So this is all straightforward so far. And for the purpose of demonstration, I'll just define a couple of parsers. Um, a string parser, which just accepts everything. Everything's a string. It always succeeds. And a double parser, which if, if it succeeds in parsing it as a double in the regular Scala way, that'll succeed. Otherwise, you'll just get a non. Um, obviously. With the greater sophistication, you might want to provide a message about how these things fail, so use a different sort of disjunction type. Um, but option is fine for our purposes. OK, so um, oh. where that is. How oh. we get to define these things? OK, so if we, we have a cell that contains hello, our, our string parser is obviously going to succeed. It always does. But our double parser has failed. And obviously, we can uh, so something like uh, 42, for example, and that succeeds. So everything's working the way we think it should so far. 
So now what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to take many of these parsers for all the data types we care about, and we want to try each of them against the cell that we can contain a value. Um, so if you know a bit about Scala, you'd probably say, well, we can put the, the parsers in a list. We can try each of them against the cell and then produce a list of the results. So if we try this, well, it, it does work. We've got um, you know, the, the hello parsed, and it didn't parse as a number. But the real problem here is that we've lost the types. So we've just got a list of option of any. We don't have any type information there. And that's obviously because the Scala compiler has had to unify the type that it's going to work with, and it, it ends up with just an any. So if you've heard a bit about um, Shapeless, you probably hear about its you know, um, flagship product, the H-list. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know that it, it allows you to somehow represent heterogeneous types. So the type can, can change for each element. And you think, well, OK, we've got parsers. They're parsing different things, and so that sounds like a good fit. Uh, so you, you, instead of putting the parsers in a list, you can put them in an H list. And you might try, you know, the naive thing, obviously, is to just try exactly the same map as we did before. So we're going to try mapping over this thing. Um, and of course, it, this doesn't work. <laughs> um, so Miles has a really, really brilliant blog post that everyone should read on this topic, whether or not you use Shapeless. Um, basically, what's going on here is the same problem at, at its core that we saw before, that if we were going to do this sort of map in a, a trivial way like this, the, the compiler is going to want a single type that it can operate with, because Scala functions, when they, they become applied, they're monomorphic. But what we really, we really need here is a polymorphic function, something that can take different types and operate on them. So this is where Scala Z, uh, sorry, this is where Shapeless's poly functions come in. Uh, so what we can do is we can define something which will call parse for us uh, in a poly function like this. Um, so what this is saying is that when we have a, a type T um, and when we encounter a parser of that type T, we're just going to call parse on this thing. Now, you notice there's a bit of a hack here to get us going, um, which is that I've, I've dumped the cell inside this thing. And this thing's an object, and that doesn't look very good. Like, we want to somehow pass the, pass the cell to this function later on. I'll, I'll get around to how you can do that, or a, a hack around how you can do that later on. But for the time being, it's just dumped in there. Um, and of course, if we run this one, oh, now this works beautifully. So uh, what we've got here is, is it's told us that we've got an option of a string. So this corresponds with the parser of the string up here. We have an option of a double, which corresponds with the parser of the double. So it, it's now usefully tracked the types all the way through. And again, at the value level, um, the hello, it passed as a string, and the 42 obviously didn't pass. So now we've got this way that we can uh, run our list of parsers with their appropriate types, and we can gather all the types up that we've actually been able to parse successfully. Um, so that's quite, quite neat. Now, the situation can become a little more complicated than this. I originally defined my parser as a case class, and that made all of this work nicely. But you might have made you know, an arbitrary decision, perhaps, to define your parser as a trait uh, at the beginning. And if you had done that, you would have discovered that simply writing uh, at parser of t would have failed. Um, and so there's this extra trick, and I, I mention it because you may come across this relatively early on. Um, of applying a type constraint in a slightly different way. So what you can do is you can say, we're going to have this, this function parse. Um, it can take a type T and a type S. And we have evidence that this S is a subtype of a parser of T. Uh, so it's this little extra hoop to jump through to make sure that you can actually apply this thing correctly here. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Daniel? Uh, I'm not entirely sure why. I just know that it does. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, maybe if uh, Miles. I actually think that the way oh. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion that there's two things going on here. I mean, one mm -hmm. of them is that, I mean, I, I think for the example you've shown, uh, you don't, strictly speaking, need the evidence. You could just simply put a bound on, um, uh, you could have, uh, you, could, you know, P, P is a subtype of 
uh, parser of t or something like that would probably work in this case. But I'll bet that in practice, um, what happened is that you ended up uh, running into SI2712. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, 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 the evidence there that's being used in that case is probably um, a workaround for that. So I think Travis pro possibly um, solved two problems for you. One of them was the problem with subtyping, mm -hmm. and the other was the, 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 the uh, consequent problem with, um, uh, with SI2712. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, um, actually thinking about it, I think I know what the problem is. Um, mm -hmm. Is case contravariant in its, uh, in its type parameter? Uh, in, inside of poly? Because if it's not contravariant in its type parameter, then um, saying that you want a parser is going to mess you up because you have a specific type in the age list. It's invariant. Yeah, I think I think that's actually the problem. So what's happening here is you're you're encoding the the more generic type, which is what you want, which is at, you know some subtype of parser is what your your function takes. Mm -hmm. You could encode that. I mean, you could have HList could do that for you, but uh, it does not. Um, probably for very good reasons. But uh, it, the the invariance is basically what's messing <laughs> it up. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks again. So. I suppose those two questions nicely illustrate some of the problems that beginners encounter early on. Because I <laughs> let's let, let's say that I half followed that, and I I could go through and and trace down uh, the details of that in, uh, more specifically. But you know, this is the kind of thing that you know when you're first jumping into this thing, you might well encounter. So, uh, so. Um, later on, I have some code that I'll go through at the very end, but um, this was just to show you know, how you can get off the ground with this. And often starting in the REPL with this sort of thing is really useful. Um, what, what you need to do later on, though, obviously need, you need some way of passing the cell in as a parameter to this function. Um, and one simple way to do this one quick hack is to just zip it with the list of parsers every time you, you encounter a new cell. Um, Another thing you need to do is package it as a function. At the end, I'll, I'll look at what that involves. That's slightly more involved because you need to provide implicit evidence of a whole load of operations that can be done. So the second part of my talk, oh, thanks. <laughs> the second part of my talk involves looking at maps as semigroups. Um, so imagine that we've got this list of values here, trues, falses, um, and if we want to identify that these are categorical variables, what we'd like to do is aggregate a count of the values in this list. So we want to know how many trues there were, how many falses there were. Um, so what we can do is, first of all, we can take all these items in the list, all the trues and falses, and we can map them to single element maps. So every element, we've just got a false one, true one, and so on. So whether it was true or false, they're, they're mapped to a count of one. And then what we can do is combine all of these. So we, we took those single element maps and we just called this magical function somehow, combine all, which squished them all together and counted them up for us. So if you've never seen this before and you maybe come from a Java background, this is very mysterious. Um, so what's going on? Um, well, uh, this is a, one of the problems the mathematicians have nicely solved for us. Basically, what's happening here is that values in the map, because they're integers, they're instances of a semigroup. And what cats can do via algebra, you can construct monoid and semigroup for a map, provided that all of its values uh, are semigroup instances. So a semigroup is just a set with an associated binary operator. So a good example of this um, because I like to have concrete examples, is uh, int and a plus. So you know that you can add integers in any order, which was covered nicely this morning. And a monoid is an ex kind of extension of a semigroup where you have an identity element. And the idea of the identity element is you can use that, com use that binary operator in, in any order and you end up with the same element back. Um, so in our case, int, plus, and zero form a monoid. Um, so, in our case, because int is a monoid, and we've got a map of some key to int values, we can turn this into a monoid as well. And um, that's what's going on here. Okay, so the complete code for this is in this repository, um, but I'll, I'll just briefly show you um, 
this is a kind of more extended version of the, the talk that you can go through. Um, so these are the parses that I went through at the beginning. And I should show you, okay, so what happens when we want to do a bit more interesting stuff um, with shapeless is we, we often end up having to provide these, these implicit parameters. And basically, whenever you see one of these blocks, this is providing the additional evidence to the compiler that you can do all of the things that you claim you can do with the types that you're using, basically. Um, so I, I just thought I'd show that briefly, because this is, this is kind of terrifying to a beginner compared with hopefully what I showed in the talk. Um, but it's really just, just providing that extra evidence. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll stop there perhaps, but you can actually execute this whole thing and go through it in more detail. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> So, uh, like, hypothetically, you know, if you had the maintainers of Shapeless or Cats or something in the room with you right now, <laughs> you know, hy just hypothetically, I mean, what parts of this process do, do you kind of imagine would, are, like, the hardest, either just, you know, just in general because they're hairy, or do you think that there's sort of specific things that you imagine if they were to exist, they would, like, help make the process easier? Because I, I definitely take sort of the, multi the several points you made about, like, this is the sort of place where someone might easily get confused or mm -hmm. have problems, and... You know, like, it's not, there's no, probably not one panacea, but, like, is there something in your mind where you're like, man, you know, if this had existed, it really would, it would make this a lot easier to talk about? Yeah, so um, there's several resources that are, are very good for this. So, <laughs> surprisingly, one of them is just the feature list for Shapeless. I think Shapeless 2.0, maybe, has a, a very good feature list, and that's kind of a, a catalog of things you can pick and choose from, really. Um, there's a, also somebody, I can't remember his actual name, I think his website has EE something or other, uh, Eugene, Eugene, yeah. So he, his, his website's also very good. He kind of took a kind of walking tour of Shapeless. That, that's also another very good resource. But yeah, I think m more resources like that would help cut down on, on these sorts of issues that people encounter. Um, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but yeah. It's not really a question. I just wanted to do some uh, promotion of uh, Scala exercises, because in a couple of weeks, you're going to have the feature list uh, from Shapeless and also all of the uh, type classes and data types from CAT uh, available online to complete all those exercises in your browser. So you'll be able to go through each one of those uh, concepts and try them out yourself. More question? Not then, thanks. Okay. Thanks.